Hello, welcome everyone. And we're back again with another celebration of Doctor Who. And I'm pleased to have with me a, my guest, um, director and animator, uh, Kevin John Davis. How are you, Kevin? I'm all right. Thank you very much. It's um, It's been a while since I did animation, but yeah, it's in there in my weird schizophrenic CV. So thanks for inviting me. Uh, you're very welcome. Right. So as we're talking about Doctor Who, um, we will be talking about it in quite in length as well. But other things, of course, that you've been involved with. But, with, but um, I wanted to ask you first, because um, you were born in the early 60s. So you would remember the black and white era of Doctor Who. Um, so I wondered, really, Kevin, what would be your first kind of memory of Doctor Who? Did you have a sort of like just sort of flashes of vivid images or... What what's the sort of first thing you kind of remember that stuck in your mind? Well, I'm, I'm as you say, I'm two years older than the program itself. Um, in fact, there's a picture of me as a baby in arms in my grandparents' uh, arms at, a, at my christening in September of '61, and there in the background is a police box because I grew up in a flats above shops, right next to a, a real genuine police box, and it was just always there in my childhood. I didn't really think much of it. Um, but yes, I remember um, Hartnell. I can remember certain flashes of memory. I remember particularly a rather good jelly and ice cream party that I went to locally um, with with um, a, it was a little girl's birthday. I've made uh, contact with her since on Facebook through um, for a local you know Facebook group, and um, she sort of confirmed roughly when it was and everything. But I seem to remember watching that because the parents made a big deal out of it, turned all the lights off, and all the kids sat down cross-legged on on the mat looking up at the television. And I was sat on an adult's lap, if I remember correctly. Can't remember who that was, and wow. we all watched it together. It was a big old deal. Somehow it's woven in with a, a memory of um the famous bit where um uh, brian kant's character is um scrabbling through the jungle and is confronted by a dalek which oh, of course, yeah, yeah. The, clip, the clip turned up years later and it was like bringing a childhood memory back to life seeing that again first of all i think i saw it as a series of tele snaps and of course now that clip exists but um that and also being traumatised by the rill in Galaxy 4. <laughs> the face at the window, which I gather was the end of episode two. And I literally was hiding behind my mother's armchair. Yeah. And I had an uncle, a very inspirational uncle, who was very clever at drawing and magic tricks and playing the guitar and things. And um, he was a bit of a joker. And he was, when um, the face appeared at the window, I hid. And um, as the music, the famous music, was coming to an end at the end of the episode, um, I started to peep round the side of the armchair again, and my uncle said, look out, it's back, and I hid again. And it's a <laughs> delible memory, you know, and he was lying, yeah. of course. I always wondered if it turned up again, would we find that the face did appear after the end titles? Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he was taking the mickey. But, um, yeah, no, it was it, it was always there. So uh, I remember drawing in my news at school, you'd have to write about what you did at the weekend. And I remember drawing um, Patrick Troughton's doctor hiding on the tube railway lines from the Yeti up on the platform. So... Clearly, it was something I was well into. I met my first Dalek when I was four in Selfridges. My father took me to see um, the, the, that display that was linked into the Peter Cushing, the first Peter Cushing movie. Yeah. And a big red Dalek pushed through the crowds, as I remember it. Yeah. And I hid behind my dad's leg as this enormous thing, seemed huge at the time, went past, a big red one. And um, I think it was advertising the display that was upstairs or elsewhere in the shop, which I remember as well. I remember being on my dad's shoulders, being carried down a sort of um, like a corridor of that corri corrugated plastic that they had on the sets. Oh, yes, and there, yeah, yeah. Were, there were lots of little screens running clips, which I can yeah. only assume in those days would have been back projected from from actual prints, I imagine. I guess so. Yeah, I guess so on little screens showing clips and I can yeah. remember and my dad kept moving along because there were lots of people and I said no no I want to see it more and they said no no we've got to move it's somebody else's turn you know <laughs> these are all in there somewhere they're all there, there. They're, they're all these little things yeah yeah so that's it that's my childhood memories one of my abiding childhood memories that, I, that, that will interest you Kevin is that um when I went to my primary school um right next to my primary school was shawcraft models really wow 
In Uxbridge, yeah. Yeah. So um, we used to have a Dalek that used to open our school fate that was inside <laughs> Shilcraft models. It used to be wheeled out. Oh, that would have been yeah, Bill Roberts' know. Dalek. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, the genuine. So, there's a piece of history for you because, yeah, as we quite. know, short, for people who might not know that's watching yeah. this, Kevin knows really well, and I do. Shawcraft models worked quite a lot uh, with the BBC and made props for Doctor Who in the in the sixties and so on. The macro was made there, I believe. That bloody great crab um, thing, crab yeah. thing, yeah. That's quite wheeled out famous, of crap uh, or something. It was so big, you know. Yeah, it's from um, famous um, footage, isn't there? Amateur film of the Dalek trundling about there. And, yeah. and there are beautiful photographs, some of them in colour, of the local carnival displays with uh, Doctor Who props on that they'd yeah. made on board the lorry. Like yeah, a yeah. Zarbi and a, a Venom Grub. I remember those. That's another thing I remember is my nan used to get me the uh, water-based transfers that you could then slip oh, yeah. them off onto paper. You soak them in a saucer and the paper would curl up and then you slid the little transfer off onto the paper that's right i remember and i remember the zarbi and the and the monotron and the little venom grubs and i always wondered what they were of course i found out later on i mean i was the right age for when um people like jan vincent rudski and jeremy bentham stephen payne people like that were were running the early days of dwas and that's when we kind of found out everything. Everyone up till that point, the only source of information we had, I think, was um, the tenth anniversary special from the Radio Times, yeah. which a friend of mine had. I didn't have it at first. My mum tried to get it for me, but it was too late. It sold out by then. Um, and I used to borrow it off this friend at school and pour over it and write out all those story descriptions by hand. You know. Yeah. Um, and that that kind of made uh, h hundreds up and down the country of little mini experts. Um, of course, later we found out all the titles were were wrong <laughs> in the early days. Yeah, yeah. Um, the episode titles, and um, uh, yeah, it was fascinating. And of course, in the very first convention in seventy seven was a big deal. I was sixteen, so I was right in the thick of it all, and yeah. helped set up on the Friday b before the event opened and um because i was friendly with them all by then they were average yeah. sort of three or four years older than me most of them um and you know they made lifelong friends there you know and, I, and another guy who was a very good friend i met at art college I, I did art college instead of sixth form um in late 77 i i and i met this guy at my college and i was wearing the convention t-shirt and he went i was there <laughs> and we realised we yeah. were both at the same event, but we didn't meet until a few weeks later. So, yeah, it's just uh, amazing how the programme has created, you know, great friendships and links and people who went on to do things professionally, to write books. And, you know, in my case, lots of my friends um, that I made over the years worked in uh, sculpting and special yeah. effects and things like that. I mean, I, I dreamt of becoming a special effects person. I wanted... To, to work when I read particularly Bernard um, um, Wilkie's book, The Technique of Special Effects in Television, I treated that like a Bible. And I had an accidental meeting with him once when I was visiting oh. visual effects as a professional later on. Yeah. And um, I got to know Matt Irving a bit. And as I was going in the gate, an old boy was shuffling forward in front of me. And the commissioner said, Hello, Bernard, what are you doing back here? And I couldn't believe my luck. And it was him. It was him I, yeah. I, I told him I treated his book like a Bible. And he's, he kind of poo-pooed it. Oh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about that if I were you. You know, it's not that, you know, uh, some of it's a bit old-fashioned now. And all. Even yeah. then, that was a long, long time ago. So, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, was, that was a big deal. I was delighted to meet him. But, yeah. of course, then I realised later on that you need to be a really good handyman. You need to be able to turn your hand to all sorts of craft yeah. work you know electronics and sculpting and things i did a bit of sculpting but um i realized i was much better at drawing things than i was at making things and yeah. uh, so i ended up in animation but uh my, a lot of my friends i was hanging out with a few the other day it was somebody's birthday and there were a lot of people there i met the guy who radio controlled the eyes of the meep um oh really <laughs> he's, he's a real big oh, cool. yeah. star wars circles yeah, uh, Brooke yeah. Herring. he he played hundreds of different alien characters in star wars and he said he didn't he wasn't really much of a doctor who fan but he thoroughly enjoyed doing the meep 
So yeah. that was, and it was on at the time. I said, I can't believe we're here and we're not actually at home watching the telly. Yeah. In the day, you know, you had to be a bum on seat, you know, in order to see this thing. Because you thought once it was shown, you'd never see it again. Yeah. And if you missed one, woe betide. That's right. And of course, you know, you've got DVDs on the shelf and Blu rays coming, and, you know, yeah. you just kind of, it's what exists is all available, which is extraordinary. It is, yeah, absolutely. So when when you um, so what what were you what were you try, uh, um, what was your goal when you were at college or or, or school? What, what well, were you studying? As I say, for? visual effects. That's what was, I did. Visual yeah. effects you were studying. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. um, I I went. So I did a year as pre foundation, really, to get my A level art a year early, and then I went to the London College of Printing um for another year to do a, a foundation course but i was hot to try i wanted to run before i could walk yeah. i wanted to get into the business i didn't want to do the three-year ba course that follows yeah um and so but i got lucky i'm very very lucky and ended up in a little tiny animation company over in west london in hanwell um called peer studios limited and uh, even that seems to have been a fluke i i joined the capital radio job mate scheme who got me the gig uh, or got me the interview, you know, and um, uh, have you still got me? Cause I've got mute suddenly come up on my screen. No, oh, maybe. oh so no, sorry. I'll carry on. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was worried you'd lost me there. No, um, I'm just yeah, no, it yeah. Was, it, it, so I joined uh, peer studios. I had an interview with them and started on the Monday. And at that point I was actually a, a librarian. I was a Saturday boy. And I went in and quit that on the Saturdays. And my mother was trying to encourage me to carry on, you know, have two jobs. And it was yeah. like, no, I, yeah, yeah. I, I'd done with the library. I wanted to do this, you know. And so they gave me a very good grounding as almost a kind of uh, an informal apprenticeship. Mm. Um, you know, my father did a real apprenticeship in engineering for seven years. And mine lasted from late, late 79 through to the middle of 83 with rod lord and all my colleagues you know it was a tiny little animation company but that was great because it meant we all did a bit of everything yeah and by by yeah. within a year or two i was the same as them everyone everyone barring the secretary you know there was only six of us one of them was the secretary he was slightly older than all of us right most of the chaps were you know 10 11 years older than me so i was very much the junior but um we all we all made the tea and in the end we all worked the rostrum camera and we did all the stages of animation in between we didn't do a lot of um traditional cartoon work they were mainly diagram animation right for industrial um medical those kind of training films business films that kind of thing and it was film in those days it was pre video really taking off for that kind of television yeah um, you know business television became a real thing in yeah. the 80s and uh, uh but within two months i had this chance meeting with the guy that was going to produce hitchhiker's guide and i introduced him to my boss rod lord and that was it we were off and running and i, I spent wow. my first pretty much my first year in the business working on the hitchhiker's tv series so that was you know so all, that, all that animation stuff you were involved with yeah it was the yeah. bits where if, if anyone's seen the series it's the peter jones bits where it's meant to be the guide it's meant to be computer graphics except it was all hand drawn yeah. and um hand lettered there was lots of, i mean i used to do a ton of letter set i mean I know <laughs> the people who used to do their own fanzines around that time will remember yeah. letter set, the rub down transfers that you could get in any number of fonts and type styles yeah and they also did standard graphics of lines and cross hatching and shading and all sorts of things and they would be sheets and sheets of this stuff we got through um and i did a lot of that on hitchhikers and and other films afterwards um and that was it that was our hub was often running in the animation business for the next 13 years wow so um at which point would you have met douglas adams well, I met him before that. I met him as an art student um, uh, when he'd just taken a full-time job as script editor of Doctor Who. Um, he'd been in the job about two weeks. He'd yeah. had no crossover with Anthony Reid, who'd suggested him, after he'd done the brilliant Pirate Planet. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. I was at a friend's house, a guy called Gavin French, 
Uh, we used to make amateur Doctor Who films together and I was at his house for a Sunday and we'd had Sunday lunch with his mum and the rest of the family. And then he said, oh, I'm going to listen to this thing on the radio. It's a, a repeat of this thing and I, on Radio 4. I thought, what the hell? You know, at that age, I wasn't interested in Radio 4. Yeah. It was, um, and he said, it's a sort of sci-fi comedy thing. It was written by the guy who wrote Pirate Planet. And I thought, ah, now you got me because that, yeah. that showed a different kind of attitude, a different sort of humour that very much connected for me. I, I yeah. grew up with The Goon Show and Monty Python and things like that. So Pirate Planet was funny, real funny. You yes, know, it, I mean, was. Doctor, <laughs> it did have the occasional bit of humour, but that showed a, a different way of thinking. Yeah. And so I was in. And then I heard Hitchhiker and that was it. I, it was, became a lifetime obsession. Um, and two weeks later, this guy, Gavin, he said... Um, I've I've secured an interview for a fanzine for TARDIS, the main Doctor Who Appreciation Society fanzine. So we're going to go and interview the guy who wrote Pirate Planet and Hitchhiker. And by that point, I'd heard two episodes of Hitchhiker. Right. And so it was it was on its second repeat that first year in late 78. And um, so I hadn't even heard the whole of Hitchhiker. But our, all our questions to start with when we got to the production office we're all about Hitchhiker. And Douglas went, oh, you know about that? Yeah. And after several questions, he said, I thought this interview was going to be about Doctor Who. He said, we're getting there. We're getting there. <laughs> um, so you could tell that we were excited about it. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and Graham Williams kept sticking his head around the office door, trying to chivvy Douglas along. He's looking at his watch going, Douglas, we, we've got this scene to write, which I gather was that last scene at the end of um, The Armageddon Factor. Right. Uh, we've got this last scene and we've got to do it this afternoon. Uh, so he was trying to hurry us up. And then Douglas, who was a famous procrastinator, drew Graham in and said, oh, Graham, they're, they're asking about such and such. And it's like, and he got involved in the conversation. <laughs> and I've still got the audio cassette. In fact, I really think oh, the only thing Gavin invited me was to bring along my new tape recorder, which I'd been given for my birthday, my 17th <laughs> birthday. Um, <laughs> so, you know, that was it. So I've, I used that cassette every now and again over the years there's a nice sort of pre-fame douglas yeah. you know where he says things like oh i've got this to do that to do i've got the book to write if only i could finish the bloody thing you know and it was another okay. year before the first hitchhiker book was published yeah by which yeah. point he'd left script editing doctor who and he was off and rolling with all the furore that surrounded that early days of hitchhiker when he was much in demand Yes. And I've just been I've just been doing well, as you know, I did the 42 book, which uh, most of the research on that was last year. But um, I've just recently been to the BBC Cavisham, Ar um, the Written Archive Centre, um, looking at his contracts and other paperwork to do with the TV show, because I've got another project broiling that something I've always wanted to do. But we'll see. It's not locked down yet, but it's right. been fascinating to compare Douglas's own personal paperwork, which is the subject of the 42 book, with the contractual information and the exchanges of correspondence in yeah. the BBC file to build a better picture of exactly what went on during those few days. And he really was in demand. There was an awful lot going on around that time. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a fascinating story, which I hope to tell again in a different way. Yeah. <laughs> So when 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 did you sort of transition, as it were, or or or, or where did the, the doors open for you to start uh, directing? When did you sort oh, of well, that feel was, like you wanted was, to do do that? Yeah, that was because of Hitchhiker. I mean, that first year, I borrowed um, through the Dwas. Funnily enough, um, I was great mates and still am with Mark Sinclair, who was the drama department. You know, right. I mean. There was more drama behind the scenes than there was on camera. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it normally is that way. Really it laughing that way she knows yeah. Mark as well. <laughs> he is, he's quite a drama queen himself. But um, he, he, uh, he's fantastic. I love him. Um, he, he was crazy. He had great ideas about making our own Doctor Who epic, you know, on 8mm film. Yeah. Um, yeah. But he also knew somebody who um, lived in North London, so not far from me, who owned a portable VHS camera system. Right. Now, I played reel-to-reel yeah. -reel black and white video at school. This was a very archaic system. 
uh, Real to Real Sony video, which I messed around with at school with my friends in 75, 76, around that time. So this is 1980, and I borrowed this portable. I mean, I don't believe this guy lent it to me as an 18-year-old. I borrowed this yeah. setup, which was this heavy, it was supposed to be portable, but this heavy piano keys type VHS machine on a strap right um, with cable so one person carried the machine and the other one carried the camera and did the camera <laughs> yeah operator. really really my heavy friends stuff. and i we took part my yeah. wife was there as well you know long before she was actually married to me poor woman um but uh, we went around the studios um yeah. of hitchhikers filming behind the scenes particularly on the pilot episode and there's yeah. a few snips on my youtube channel um and um yeah that that footage and all the photographs that i used to take i used to again borrow the camera i wasn't wealthy i've never been really wealthy but i i didn't have a decent camera but i borrowed um susan moore's camera and she went on to work on doctor who later on and she yeah. sculpted zelda for terror hawks and things like yeah. that um and she yeah. used to snap away and i snapped away and we can't even remember now who took which pictures but um we got lots of photographs as well of behind the scenes on hitchhiker alan bell was extraordinary the producer sadly passed away only mere weeks ago um mm. but he was always kind to me he didn't get on with douglas they were two different men uh, luckily i was friendly with both of them um but it was never the twain they yeah. you know they came from different worlds and they had different outlooks on life i think it needed the two of them my perspective on it is that douglas had all the imagination and you know the kind of uh footlight style uh sketch writing ideas mm. and whatnot. alan bell was an old died in the wall bbc man who knew how to make things happen yeah. within the structure of the bbc and i think you needed both for the tv series of hitchhiker to be as special as it was and um they gave me great latitude the pair of them and and um to get back to your question about 12 years later they finally got the rights the bbc the rights were held up for a long time and the bbc wanted to put it out as home video and mark ayres you know the famous mark ayres who's been a mate since the yeah. last days in the late 70s he said do you know the bbc are going to put out a home video of hitchhiker I said, are they he said yeah you should get in touch with them and see if they'd like some of your behind the scenes footage yeah yeah long before DVDs and extras and things. He said, maybe you could do a little 10 minute piece on the end of the video. And so I contacted them and they said, well, can you send us some bits? They were a bit sniffy. Yeah. Can you just send us a few bits, see what you got? So I copied off about an hour's worth onto a videotape and posted it to them. And I got a call saying, this is great. Have you got much more of this? I said, I've got about seven hours. So we talked about it. But what they really wanted me to do was to hand over all my footage. Right. Let them make something. And they did appoint Viv Cousins, who had been a Blake 7 director, um, who was friends with, I think, um, Penny, who ran BBC Video. Um, but we didn't, we, we didn't exactly hit it off because i was a bit guarded a bit and, and this woman didn't really know hitchhiker she was just doing it as a job you know and yeah um, kept referring to instead of saying full prefect she'd say the bloke in the blazer that right. kind of thing that's what i remember so yeah. anyway i complained about this bitterly to someone who said who turned out their girlfriend was john lloyd's secretary put me in touch with john lloyd who remembered me from yeah. years earlier from the hitchhikers thing and um he and douglas conferred and they both decided to bat for me and john introduced me to his agent the big agent mark berlin who was then with london management now semi-retired runs his own company um and he got his assistant to represent me in negotiations with the bbc and they backed me they said this is the guy it's his footage he knows this stuff inside out you should let him do it and they did mm. They gave me Alan Bell as a kind of guardian angel. He came on the first shoot, the big shoot with um, Arthur Dent returning to his house at the original location as used 12 years earlier in the series. Yeah. And he gave me a few little pointers. He was very kind. He sort of took me to one side and quietly said, uh, you might want to think about doing it over here or you know, where to place the camera and 
he was like a safe pair of hands. Um, yeah. The uh, that and also I got similar treatment when I did Thirty Years in the TARDIS with the cameraman, an old yeah. Aussie cameraman. He was like the Crocodile Dundee of the BBC Ealing camera department, okay. um, and he was marvelous. And he did the same. I think it's lovely, and I would do this with anyone else that I'm advising. Not in front of the crew, not so as not to embarrass, but yeah. take people to one side and say, "Hey, did you think about doing it this way?" Yeah. And that way you learn, you know. Oh, yeah. And now for the last, well, I'm just starting on the sixth year now, of um, of being a visiting lecturer at the University of Hertfordshire, on the um, MA film course, and I do that very much there. I'm I'm there as an extra pair of eyes and ears, alongside my friend who is the main. Uh, lecturer um and uh we advise um masters film students on how to shoot things and different approaches to take and, and it is a case of just sort of passing on the the knowledge you know which um, yeah. alan bell and and john adderley the cameraman on 30 years were kind enough to do to me yeah. i mean when when i was given that gig and you know to fully answer your question i got the gig because i had all that footage um and i think it was uh very much the encouragement of the producer david jackson david m jackson because there are several david jacksons in the business yes. david m. jackson a lovely bloke who was assigned as my producer at bbc video who again gave me lots of encouragement and um it counts for a lot when you've got the backing of people that know what's what and oh, yeah. take a chance on you and that's what they did and so um i had help with alan Alan at the edit for the making of Hitchhiker. And so the making of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy came out 13 years after the TV series in uh, March of 93. And it was my first directing gig. But all the way through being an animator, I'd experimented with doing video projects. We'd done a thing called Alf Vida Same Pet, which was um, during the Doctor Who hiatus when Colin's show was off the air for 18 months. We did a puppet show with friends of mine, Stephen Mansfield and Susan Moore. Right. Stephen, who's now top sculptor at Two Swords, you know, but had yeah. worked with Fitting Image before that. And, you know, they were, again, they were all starting out on their career. So I had a great little team around me who, who helped me on all these various projects that got me off and rolling as a director. But at the time, I'd been making commercials for five years and I was working with real you know, blue chip clients on, on big expensive commercials. Yeah. After a year at Roger Rabbit in 87, uh, 87, 88, I'd been a special effects animator on Roger Rabbit. And I went with my head of department, Chris Knott, to a company called Passion Pictures and worked there on commercials for five years. And that again was another good grounding in being an animator's eyes and ears on a live action shoot oh, yeah. and learning about how the camera worked, how to work with actors, mostly there are children actually quite a lot um, in commercials where you'd shoot an Invisible Man type movie and then add an animated element into it, mm. a cartoon character or whatever it happened to be. We did all sorts, you know, and it was, a, it was a, a weird hybrid grounding. And the more I did live action stuff, the more I resented sitting at a drawing board. Yes. And, yeah, uh, yeah. And also at that time, it was just changing into going digital and uh, people were starting to experiment with, I think, the Amiga and things like that, computers. And I thought and I'd stupidly I said, I don't want to sit at computer for the rest of my career. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we all do now. I mean, yeah. it doesn't matter what line of business. Uh, yeah, now, yeah, of course, want. everything <laughs> rolls around it now. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So that's why my my career has been kind of schizophrenic, really, of not quite you know i do a bit of this and then i try a bit of that and you know i did do 30 years in sort of doing archive documentaries on and off you know it's uh as i always say you know I, it, it, a freelance lifestyle feast or famine i know i look like there's been a lot of feasts but <laughs> believe me there's some famine you do get lulls too many oh yes lulls. you do yeah you, you do get ups and downs yeah but, uh, but getting but, on to, uh, if, I, if I may, Kevin, getting on to 30 Years in the TARDIS. Of course, yeah. Well, well that, that grew out well, of making a that, that came sort of came from all this, yeah. Yeah. Um, how, because it was, a, it was when you look at it, and I've seen the making of as well, I think, yeah. you've got a making of, of it. Is that right? I've got, well, there's sort of behind the scenes bits. So I've Some got behind the scenes, yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I'm getting them a bit mixed up. There's more of the making of for Shakedown, which we'll talk about later on. Oh, yeah, it was a making of Shakedown, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, the amount of work in that is just colossal. <laughs> uh, the, the things you're up against on that was amazing. But um, but how how did you did you pick how did you pitch this idea to the BBC? Because at that time, the BBC didn't really want to know Doctor Who. No. I was wondering luckily, how difficult it was to get this thing off the ground. Yeah. You know? Luckily. Um... Because it must have been pretty tough, I imagine. Because yeah, there was there was um, um, a department within the BBC, music and arts had yeah. a sub department, an autonomous unit called the Late Show Productions. Now they they made the Late Show, which was a regular strand on BBC Two, usually quite late at night, um, and so the Late Show was an arts program and yeah. would cover all sorts of news and whatever was going on in the arts. But they would make specials. They did a great one in 89 for the first uh, Tim Burton Batman film, um, which is actually up on my, my YouTube channel because I'd never said I couldn't find it online. And I realized I still had my off air copy. So um, where a little boy goes into an attic and finds all the Batman memorabilia and they had experts come in, you know, child psychologists and all sorts of things, which is very late showy kind of thing to do. Yeah, yeah. The experts, as I discovered. Um, and uh, but I was introduced by David Jackson, who was my producer um, on the making of Hitchhiker. Um, we rolled from that into the making of Blake Seven, which was an abortive attempt to do a making of Blake Seven. Yeah. I did nine interviews and then it got shut down because of arguments with Terry Nation's infamous uh, agent, Roger Hancock. And they all right. slow yeah. it all down. The that yeah. BBC video wanted it out by Christmas, but Hancock's lot said, no, wait, we want to talk this through. And, it, and they slowed up the whole process. So it got stymied. But I then rolled straight into the 30th birthday. We knew it was coming up. And he introduced me to John Whiston, who was head of the Late Show Productions um, over in the East Tower uh, at Television Centre. Mm. And he loved the making of Hitchhiker and he wanted me to just do it again, but about Doctor Who. Yeah, that was the brief. And he said, but we've got other ideas like we, we want to we might want some little five minutes, you know, little sort of bullet point pieces about different aspects of Doctor Who. And if you've got any ideas, can you write them up and send them to me? So over yeah. the next few weeks, I cobbled together all sorts of different ideas that I had. The most grandiose one was to do a thing called The Legend Begins, which had dramatised accounts of how Doctor Who became into being. Right. And yeah. it was going to have uh, somebody cast as William Hartnell. And does this sound familiar? <laughs> yeah, I was just, um, I was just going to say that. Yeah. yeah. Wonder, and it was quite I've an elaborate this, I've, I've heard this somewhere before. Yeah. Yeah. But it was, they were the dramatized bits around the documentary yeah. part. And uh, even Verity Lambert was involved at one point because we have pitched it to her and she said, well, it's great to do it at cinema Verity. So it's great, but I can't do it unless the late show you know says yes and they said oh no this is too elaborate it's going to cost too much money we can't do this what other ideas have you got you know mm -hmm. and um for the five minutes i did something called um the unsung heroes of doctor who and it was going to take different aspects of doctor who and i remember one of them was about the special effects i wanted to do something about the visual effects department because yeah. i already knew some of them matt irvin in particular he was always yeah. wonderful with the fans always um and so there were all different aspects. I think I wanted to do a bit on the Radiophonic Workshop. And um, and I didn't really know what these five minute bits were for. As it transpired later on, once I was getting more involved with John Whiston and his gang, um, they said, look, we want to, you know, because they were all uh, people that had worked with Alan Yentov. And he was now, I think at that time, head of BBC Two, if I remember right. Anyway. Um, yeah, I think he was around that one. time, yeah. yeah. I can't remember. Uh, no, he was head of BBC One and he was in discussions we didn't know at that time with BBC Enterprises about a big drama of Doctor Who. And of course, that that was then it turns out he'd been talking to Philip Siegel um, about doing it with Spielberg's mob. But right. also they were going to do one at Enterprises called The Dark Dimension. Oh, yes. Yeah, my yeah, my yeah. post-production background handling high-end special effects with the new digital compositing techniques 
I was assigned to the Dark Dimension as their post-production effects advisor. And there was one production meeting, which to me, anyone who read the making of Doctor Who, Terence Dick's book, remembers that, you know, they have a meeting where the director would introduce you to all the heads of department, yeah. go around the table, and it, exactly what happened with Graham Harper, introducing everyone around the table. Tony yeah. Harding and uh, Mike Tucker were there, who I already knew. Um, and um, the whole bit, costume, everyone. And it was really going to happen. And yeah. um, we talked then about the idea of we were going to have a shot where the camera went round the TARDIS and in through the doors straight into the studio. Uh, and Graham Harper was so excited by that idea and I was selling him on the idea we could do it we should do that we should show that it really is on location and then we go in you know yeah yeah um and um uh it was all going to happen and then I got the go-ahead to do my program which was going to be a straight documentary with the template of the Batman special a little boy you know gets involved in the history of the program. And I was able to play at Doctor Who with the wraparound drama bits, threading the documentary together. And yeah. for two hours on this particular day, it was a Friday, which got nicknamed Freaky Friday. I didn't know about the dramas going on elsewhere, but I paced up and down in my kitchen thinking, now what am I going to do? Because I realised for the same deadline, we were either going to make the biggest Doctor Who that ever been, yeah. with me as a small cog in the machine running the post-production effects or i was going to direct a documentary about doctor who and be a director you know for a bbc one thing and i couldn't make up my mind which i really wanted to do most be a big fish you know in a smaller pool or get involved in the biggest doctor who ever and it was yeah. so difficult and then two hours later i got the phone call saying dark dimension had been canned and that was freaky friday and it was like mm. it took the weight off my shoulders because the decision was made for me yeah, yeah. And that was a dilemma for a bit so anyway the next you know two months were crazy with trying to do doctor who you know justice for the whole 26 years um the whole shebang really and tell the whole story with um sample people from each era yes um, and then of course they said be in the late show they wanted to have their experts in there you know right. you have to get that i think they they gave me a list and i can't remember it all now but it was like a politician uh someone from the clergy you know <laughs> uh all sorts of like criteria for you know fashion and design and you know all these experts and that and i, I thought oh really i just want to tell the story of those who made it yeah but they wanted it as an arts thing and i'd had so much freedom on the making of hitchhiker i tried to use that freedom again on on this thing for bbc one which was not the right approach i really should have sort of done my homework and worked out what the late show really was and yeah. what they expected and so at the last knockings after weeks and weeks of production being left alone by the producer who was signed assigned to look after me john bush um he was never there he was doing something else but he would pop in every now and go and i go i've got this yeah. and he left me to get on with it and then he got told off because he should have had more of an eye on what I was up to. Right. I'd only just started editing and I was told John Wister wants to see the cut. And I didn't realize the editor was nervous because we hadn't really got enough done because in my world, you shoot things, then you edit. But in the late shows world, they would shoot and immediately start editing before the next shoot. You know, I was mainly shooting on Sundays because I wanted the empty streets. Yes, I always yeah. love that. My favourite story is the Dark Invasion of Earth, and I always wanted to do that thing of you know just having the <laughs> empty the lines going across the bridge. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. and like the the first episode of the Invasion of the Dinosaurs, I love all that with the empty streets. There was an Avengers or a new Avengers episode where everyone was frozen in the streets, and I loved all that. That's so I wanted right. to, I wanted yeah. to do that, you know, in yeah. that style, and so that was so we were shooting on the Sundays, and I was spent all the week organising everything. Whereas my editor was sitting waiting for me to start editing and they get they kept saying to me, the production's uh, assistant who was assigned to me, who was an old girl called Sheila Castles, lovely old girl who had been at the BBC forever. And she was like saying, you know, you've got an editor waiting to see you. We've got bookings down at REW, the company, um, you know, a bit of a taxi ride away. 
mm. go and see the editor. And it's like, well, we can't start editing yet. I haven't finished shooting. Couldn't understand it. As far yeah. as I am concerned, we'll do the editing in the last couple of weeks, yeah. which we, we in the end, the end, we did. Um, but at the same time, they felt they had to firefight this thing and get in and change it all and add a few more interviews. And the great thing was they also, at that point, extended the running time. It was a 40-minute slot originally. It became a 50-minute slot. So they threw some more money at it. and they, yeah. But they, it meant that we got extra people that I hadn't got before, like Philip Hinchcliffe. Oh, and yeah. Aronovich and people that they were bringing in yeah. amongst all the design gurus, the fashion guru, yeah. all those ex so-called experts that I didn't want were suddenly brought <laughs> in. They yeah. just used the ones that they'd used before at the Late Show. Yeah. Stephen Bailey, you know, who was famous later on for walking out on the Millennium Dome project. Right. Who set okay. up the design museum, um, who, oddly enough, we filmed outside. Um, down on Shad Thames, you know, and, and, and along Butler's Wolf. Yeah. The Design Museum was just down there, and we did a bit with Matt Irvin and K9 in front of the Design Museum. So, yeah, it was all a bit sad that last two weeks. And, of course, I moaned off to a guy that rang me and said, oh, I'm a massive Doctor Who fan, but I'm working at Time Out. Can you tell me what's going on? And I went, oh, God, the producers have taken over. It's all a mess, and it's done. And I said all the wrong things, which got into Time Out. So the boss, John Whiston, then wrote a rather sort of pointed letter for Time Out the following week saying, yes, all I saw was a terrified editor and the programme was a mess, so we've had to fix it, you know. Yeah. But it was, it was very nice to me because when it was finished and it went out, I thought that was it. I would never work for them again. Well, I, I didn't do much for them, but I did at that point. John Whiston said, would you like to do one of these five minutes?" And... Um, the five minute pieces were to build up a repeat run of Doctor Who, as you remember, it was um, Planet of the Daleks. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Five minutes to build up to a half hour, solid half hour on BBC uh, Two, I think it was, wasn't it? Um, and he said, Would you like to do one of those? After all that debacle. Yeah. He asked me, so he obviously saw something in me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, let, and they gave me complete freedom to do that. And I did the unit recruitment film. Which oh yes, yeah, yeah. Comedy, yeah. Essentially, I was sending yeah. it up. You know that the yeah. whole there used to be these big brash macho, you know, recruitment films for the army. Yeah, it's a man's life in the army, that kind of stuff. Yeah, and so I did one of those, but for unit, and sent the whole thing up, and I loved doing that, and I had complete freedom on that. A tiny crew didn't really need much. We weren't shooting; it was just an edit process, and then the voice recording, which was um, Nick Courtney. And, um, oh, God, what's his name? Julia Sawala's other half at the time. Oh, I don't know. Dexter Fletcher, who's now a big shot director himself. Oh, yeah, Dexter Fletcher, he yeah, was, yeah. He was the voice of the unit soldier. Yeah. And we all went by cab down from North London. Strangely enough, we all lived near each other. Yeah. And we all jumped in a cab down to um, the White City building where we used one of the news studios to uh, record the voiceovers. And... Um, that was lovely. I was. I'm very pleased with that. Fine, that little five minute. Uh, yeah. Other people, I dropped. I popped in and out um, as an advisor to some of the other five minutes, because a lot of them they were assigned different producers. A lot of them didn't know what they were doing. Rafe Montague was one of them. He was fine. Yeah. He knew all about it, and it, you know he worked in BBC News Graphics at the time, and he did the one about um, the TARDIS. Um, there was a woman called Joanna Bailey. I remember. Who, was very inventive director at the time she uh did um the one about the missing episodes which is quite controversial now mm. because i think she got bamboozled by a fan who was telling a bit of a bit of a story you know shaggy dog story sort of thing right. yeah um and interviewed ian levine he rang me up and said uh oh it was great they got me banging on the arm of my chair and shouting into the phone and all this i said ian do you think they were sending you up and he went oh, uh, oh you think so? <laughs> Bless him. Uh, uh, he's got a heart yeah. of gold, Ian. He's his own worst yeah. enemy. I know he gets himself in bother yeah. by speaking out, but um, isn't that Doctor Who fandom? You know, as soon as you say something, if you put your head above the parapet, someone's going to shoot it off, you know? Yeah, that's the thing, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> anyway, all these people that helped me, Steve Roberts, Paul Venesis, that I hadn't really met Paul before, um, funny enough, I only spoke to him this morning, 
Um, and, uh, you know, uh, Mark Ayres doing his usual job with the music and everything. Yeah. I mean, the producer, John Bush, had never had music scored to picture before. That's why I'd, what they saw was I'd cut all the wraparound stuff of the little boy running through London, meeting the monsters and all that. I cut all that early because I knew that had to go off to Mark to be scored. Right. And they didn't get where I was coming from. They hadn't seen because there was no meat in the documentary yet. We hadn't got to that bit in the edit. Um, but when they saw it all put together, I think they relented and realised, oh, no, this is, and John Bush loved it said, you know, I've never had music scored to picture before. This is amazing when we were at the dub and putting it in. Yeah. And uh, Nick Courtney came to do the voiceover and uh, he'd been told outside by someone, Kevin's having a hard time with the producers, but he came over and said some nice things and well done, old chap, sort of thing, you know, yeah. rather nice. And I got the similar treatment, funny enough, the year later, having cut it to feature length, we had a screening of the feature length cut more than 30 years in the TARDIS. Yes. Yeah. And after, and after the screening, which was very funny in itself, because at one point there's uh, Larry Turner, the fashion woman says um, about John Pertwee, I'd go anywhere with it because he's so damn sexy. And he was behind me in the row going, here, here, madam. <laughs> <laughs> funny. Yeah. They did some panels on stage, but at the end, after the screening, I felt a hand on top of my head like this. And I thought it was a friend mucking around. I turned around, it was Pertwee. Who was, <laughs> oh, who was, yeah. he, was he was he was up and he was leaving, you know, to getting out of the, the cinema effectively. Yeah. Put his hand on my head. I felt it was because I put my hand on top of that, did not knowing who it was. And it was him, sort of almost going like, Well done, son, kind of thing. <laughs> and um, it was lovely. But a friend of mine spot it by saying, No, I think he was just steadying himself, he was gonna trip over. <laughs> <laughs> maybe yeah maybe yeah <laughs> but it was great and all those people of course that and as i said at bafta looking in the audience as liz sladen and you know john pertwee and various i said this is all wrong you know there was a sort of nervous titter in the audience yeah. you know what I, mean? yeah. I went i'm up here and all my heroes are in the audience yeah and, that and, must be quite strange. Yeah. and of course uh, it was a lovely experience and it led on to doing uh shakedown and um you know the other things that came later so yeah uh, shakedown led on to doing space island one as a director um i soon realized that series television is not really my thing you have to kind of fit into the pattern of whatever it is and i found it very difficult and it is like working on a kind of role of not a, what's the word it's more like a, like a conveyor belt you know yeah. Yeah. i did I, in in oh when was it 2010 2011 I was an edit producer for a while, just for a, a few TV credits and, and for the money. Mm. I did Cash in the Attic. Oh, and yeah, it had been yeah. running for 10 years at that point. I joined in for like the final year or two. Um, and it is, it's a sausage making yeah. machine. You just bang them all out, lots and lots of episodes, all the same. Um, yeah. And it's a bit soul destroying. Whereas I like, uh, you know, I did do art school a little bit and I'm kind of I've got the artist in me as like, I want to express myself I want to make something that I care about and it's very difficult to care about series television in that way it um, is. yeah you know not to decry brilliant people like Graham Harper and others you know they they seem to you know do it their way and yeah. I admire what they do but it wasn't for me but I did I did enjoy the library and archive research aspect of making archive television um and the book that i've just done and i'm going to be doing some more books it's all lined up new things are happening it's the same work it's the research part that i get excited about yeah, i had yeah. been a librarian you know on a saturday boy for for a year or so my mum was a librarian my my dad was a mechanic stroke engineer you know i kind of i think i had skills of both yeah. in putting programs together you know, working out the story and the mechanics of how to do it. And, but the bit I love is going into the archive and the library and researching things uh, and finding the story, you know, and then working out how to tell that story. And I like working with really big archive. Um, for Rafe Montague, I mentioned earlier, who did the title sequence for 30 years in the TARDIS and who worked at the BBC. Um, he used to handle all the photo galleries for the DVDs for Doctor Who. Um, uh, he was, uh, you know, he's a good producer and he asked me 
to do a private project for the Bewley estate, which was to do his father, Lord Montague, was his 80th birthday. Right. And he, that man had been covered right from coming home as a newborn babe. They had amateur film, 80 years of history, you know, yeah. that was a big story to tell. And we did it as a sort of, this is your life with video yeah. inserts. And, and uh, I thoroughly enjoyed that. Uh, and I've got another project I'd like to do with Rafe and we're talking about it. So yeah, it's, it's using the big archive is what I really now enjoy and uh, telling those stories. Yeah. Excuse me. So um, another big undertaking for you, um, and I have to ask you, where did the seed of the idea come from and why, why did you want to go for this spin-off um, where you did Shakedown, which ah. is the, the, the return of the Sontarans? Behind my head uh, there, I think, Shakedown. Yeah, do you want to bring it over there uh, um, yeah, get it to the screen so we can see? Please, yeah. Um, That's... <laughs> that me. is the only release so far was that and one that Keith Barnfather did at real time he repackaged it right. but it was made independently for the company that now own it is Big Finish because it was made ah. partly with money by Jason Hay Gallery right um it was made for Dreamwatch magazine Gary Lee who put up most of the oh money. yes yeah 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 Jason cool. topped him up with a few a few grand to help us get it done it was a very small budget for a film about 25 grand all told um and um we filmed on hms belfast for two weeks hms belfast was a uh sort of just at the end of world war ii but really like into the 50s battleship that is now a museum moored up in front of tower bridge yeah um and i'd heard because we we realized we had the money for either to build a set or to hire a studio we couldn't afford both right. i remember that Douglas <laughs> trumbull when he made um silent running yeah had used an old decommissioned aircraft carrier as his spaceship corridors down below decks and i said to mark Ayers, we were recording actually soundtracks um atmos and things down yeah. at butler's wharf for him to do a really good sound mix uh, stereo sound mix on uh, more than 30 years in the TARDIS and we were driving back over Tower Bridge when I said well you know what Douglas Trumbull did we ought to do that you know we could go and top below decks on HMS Belfast and he literally at the end of the bridge he turned the car around and we went back he said let's go and check it out so we just bought a ticket and went on board and checked out Belfast yeah and went down below deck and we told somebody there what we were thinking of doing. And they said, oh, well, there are other areas that the public aren't allowed to go. But I don't know whether now they might be part of the exhibition. I don't know, but yeah. um, there were exhibition areas and there were original areas and we had access. So what we, I met up with the guy on board who was like the manager of the place because it has got function rooms, you know, for sort of business ventures and weddings and things. I don't know, whatever they do there. But, um, and he said, you know, how much? And we said, well, we've got this much. And he went, that'll do. <laughs> so we had HMS Belfast for two weeks for two grand. Wow. And, so, yeah. and total free run. And we mostly filmed in the evenings after all the public had gone home. Because unfortunately, being a metal ship, all the footsteps Sounds, and everything yeah. of people wandering around the exhibition yeah. echoed and resonated down through the ship. Yeah. And then when we were filming, we also found the other things that disrupted the soundtrack were uh the moorings the the ship would rise and fall because it's tidal on the thames yeah it would rise and fall and rub against the big wooden moorings you know these huge piers that were next to the ship yeah and yeah. so you get all these creaks and things and it was a fantastic <laughs> atmosphere i really loved it oh yeah that is what it would be i would hate to be on board a battleship during the middle of battle that must be terrifying God, yeah. um, especially yeah. the noise when you look at those sort of you know the uh artillery and all that um yeah. board. but um no it was great it was fantastic it lent a great atmosphere to it because they were solid metal walls and bulkheads yeah. and yeah. hatchways and all that um and uh, so we got our spaceship uh we got terence Dix for um you know a reasonable sum we paid him he dashed out the script ever so quick we were a replacement project for Dreamwatch convention that was coming up in the October of um, 94. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, I think it was, they were going to do, Keith and the gang and Ian Levine and people were going to do 
uh, downtime. But they cancelled it. They were all in a rush. They couldn't do it. They said they can't make it in time for the event. They'll put it off till next year. Yeah. And so Gary was determined to premiere a film at his big convention, the first one for his famous Dreamwatch magazine, born out of DWB. Right. You know, um, it was Dreamwatch Bulletin became Dreamwatch. Right. And the company was Dreamwatch. And sure enough, we managed to turn it around in about two months flat. Uh, we knew the BBC wouldn't give us the rights to the look of the Sontara, and so we had to come up with our own design. Um, we did ask, but they didn't answer us until the first day of filming, at which point they said, no, we can't give you the rights. We said, it's all right, we've designed our own, we've gone without yeah. you. Uh, but we did pay Robert Holmes' uh, wife, his widow. Yeah. Uh, we paid her some money, and she said, thank you very much, and gave the grandchildren a nice Christmas. Um, and so we had the rights to the name and the character of the Sontarans and Terence Dix to write it. We wanted a traditional Doctor Who story, and it was Mark Ayres who, to give him his credit, he said, well, why not ask Terence to write it? Yeah. You know, who's going to write this thing? And I think, well, I don't think I can. You know, so um, anyway, Terence wrote it very kindly and got came on board and visited us occasionally. And, uh, yeah, it was enormous fun, but exhausting. Yeah. Because, you know, I went into battle with my cameraman, Dave Hicks, and I had known each other for years and done lots of little projects. This is the biggest thing we'd ever done. Um, and uh, we were finding our feet. You know, I hadn't really done that much drama before. I'd already met Jan Chapel and Brian Croucher, so I got them. And um, Ian Levine was briefly involved, but I had to... I had to sort of, Gary wanted him out because he kept on trying to exert influence. And I was the the guy that had to tell Ian, sorry, mate, we're going on without you. Um, but he'd already introduced Carol to the project and I'd met her, of course, but um, it was because he was friendly with Carol that he wanted her in it. Yeah. Um, and, um, and Sophie already knew as well. We'd done various things, including 30 Years in the TARDIS. So... You know, the casting almost did itself. It yeah. was, you know, when it was written originally for Liz Sladen, but her daughter Sadie was about to start at a new school and it would have clashed. And so, and so Liz pulled out rather late in the day, which gave us a predicament. And I said, well, if I can't get my favourite Doctor Who girl, I'm going to get my favourite Blake Seven girl, which was Jan Chapel. Yeah. So, and she was good. She was playing a kind of Ripley type character. It was a terrible rip off of combination, really, of Alien. Uh, and um, uh, Horror of Fang Rock. The storyline is essentially the same. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, and, and we wanted to have the Sontaran versus Arutan. And amazingly, they still haven't done that on the actual show. That's very odd, that. They're what always talking is? about the Rutan. <laughs> they only had one appearance, enemy. yeah. We've never had the pair together. I hope no. one day they'll do it and they'll do it justice, you know. I think they will with the, with I mean with technology now. Oh well, the the Rutan could be fabulous. I mean, Rutan would look, well, look great now. My friend yeah. Tony, who I'd known from animation circles and Doctor Who fandom, Tony did a lovely uh, spinning octopus thing, uh, or more like a squid thing, really, yeah. uh, on a string that we kind of made it all ethereal and glowy and yeah, yeah. All Venesis did lovely editing on it and lots of special effects and things and gave it the filmic look. And um, we are talking about. Of course, next year will be 30 years since Shakedown. We're talking about a Blu-ray. Whether we can pull it off in time or, you know, if Jason and Big Finish will give us the budget, we can do yeah. it properly. Uh, there are techniques now where we can do it as a proper widescreen. It was actually cropped VHS. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. When it was released, it was only ever been released as a VHS. It's never been out on DVD even. Yeah. So yeah. it would be nice to see that finally given and the up, uh, and, and upscaled and everything yeah upscaled and the whole bit yeah i yeah. mean i don't i don't want to replace the spaceships with cgi i think i always laughingly call it my my belated college film you yeah. know that i never made one at college i should have done but i never did and yeah. it's like yeah that's that's my that's my belated college i mean it was in my early 30s but it was my college project as far as i was concerned long long delayed and uh no i loved it and i loved all the cast and you know, um, we had some tense moments. Everyone was a bit fraught. We were up yeah. against it financially and time-wise. Uh, but we got there. And it was a great, the night of premiering it, you know, we premiered it over across the convention. The big Saturday night was hilarious. And I loved it. 
So I'm very proud of that. And um, yeah, and it helped me get a couple of episodes of drama for Sky, which nobody's ever seen. Two episodes <laughs> of Space Island One, which was set on the International Space Station, but filmed out in a kind of shed near the airport on the Isle of Man for tax reasons. And um, I did get to a couple of dream sequences. I was able to take them out of the location to do some dreams. But um, mostly it was, I, I laughingly called it Space Cupboard One because right. <laughs> yeah. it was all in these pokey little sets that were yeah. meant to be the International Space Station. Uh, but yeah, it's, uh, again, you know, there were nice people on that. I quite enjoyed all sorts of aspects of that. But uh, no, the drama, drama side wasn't really for me. It takes some different skills and different ways of thinking. But um, yeah, I've dabbled. I've dabbled. I did a bit of comedy here, and you know, but mostly it's the documentaries. And and now it's books. I mean, I've had some health issues, so working from home, I can't lug all the camera gear about anymore. Yeah, yeah. I used to do a lot of that. I can't. It's too much for me now. So um, you know, I went through a heart thing, and then I went through cancer. So. I kind of um, I'm slowing it down a bit, but doing books I can handle. I can manage that, and uh, yeah, had a big success with the Forty Two book. If you want to know about how writers write, or how Douglas Adams tried not to write, you know how he struggled with every word, you know, and he was a big hero of mine. I loved him and knew him on and off for twenty years. You know, I wasn't part of his inner retinue, but he was always very good to me. So I hope I've done him justice with the Forty Two book, which is a glorious heavy colorful picture book of all his work and it's about his writing which is the glory of douglas you know yeah so that's it that's where i'm at now i guess and uh i'm very proud that my son is now working in television you know he helped me on various uh latter day projects and things and um you know he's doing well in his own right so that continues so you kind of transfer all your hopes and dreams yeah on to the That's next generation you know and i'm spreading the word now while i, I do my little bit of consultancy yeah. as a vl at uh, at the university of hertfordshire awesome. <clears throat> but i'm do, doing conventions so hopefully i'll see some of your viewers one day we'll cross paths at a convention or something that would be lovely yeah, maybe maybe so yeah down the line somewhere hopefully yeah yeah and you yeah <laughs> um but uh, what I'll do also, Kevin, uh, regarding the books, I'll put a link in the description of this video. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I should where, say, yeah. As, as to where they can find them. The yeah. publishers, unbound.com, have been very good to me, and we're talking about new projects, one of which yeah. is about Douglas, uh, something slightly different, um, but more of that anon. Yeah. Um, but meantime, Kevin, thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. Enjoyed yeah. it. Thank you. It's um, been great. It's always fun to talk about your work when you're proud of it, you know. Oh, absolutely. Even the, even the awkward be. bits, even yeah. the awkward bits when you end up having a row with the producer in time out. Yeah, <laughs> it's all part of it. It's there's always going to be some some, <laughs> some problems along the line. It never can't be smooth sailing all the way, can it? Really. Well, hopefully next year it will be the anniversary, the thirtieth anniversary of thirty years in the TARDIS, and I'm hoping there'll be a book. I was asked to do it this year, but it we kind of ran out of time, so I said, "Well, look, it's another anniversary." Yes. Of the feature length version next yeah. year. So um we'll well, hopefully see. something can come out come out come out of the, the, the thing you mentioned about uh, shakedown as well, you know. I hope so, because I would, a, I would like to see it given the upscale and yeah. um, and released properly, you know, on, on a modern format. And some new new extra features on it and things like that. You know, yeah, maybe... we'll, we'll we'll have a little Perhaps we'll have a little get together with those of us that survive. Yeah. Get together on board, as Brian Croucher said. I was invited onto Kevin's boat <laughs> <laughs> in the making yeah. of Shakedown. I remember him saying that, and that was yeah. quite funny. He was a laugh. He kept us sane because you know Jan could get a little bit fraught, but Brian diffused everything because he's he's a jolly bloke. It was good to have someone like that, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. And there's all sorts brewing for next year. It, it goes on. Everything I do, and I, I'm surrounded by all sorts of archive, unfortunately. I'm a bit yeah. of a hoarder. And um, they all get reused again. You know, this stuff, the beauty of it is, as you know, as a fan and everything, it never goes away. That's right. Yeah. And we celebrate. Exactly. You, get, you know, all, your, all the stuff you've shot at the time, all the photographs. Yeah. All these things at some point are going to be very important again. 
yeah you know, it's extras on dvds or whatever it might be people have found, I love that kind of thing to, yeah. i was talking yeah. to paul canises this morning and yeah he's <laughs> currently archiving all sorts of important stuff including yeah. including rushes from things i've done yeah uh, so they're preserved you know that's lovely yeah and they should be that's right very important thank stuff, you mate yeah. i've really enjoyed it thank you thank you kevin and uh thank you guys for watching yeah um, we'll, we'll we'll see you very soon with some more uh of these uh, uh interviews until then take care guys and bye-bye